All right. It's called There Is No Mayan Team uh, Towards More Collective Management Culture. And thank you all so much for accepting the talk, allowing me to get up here and platform an idea that I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, I'm really excited to be here at Monktoberfest. This is my first time here at the conference. And a little nervous to be up here. I will try not to get through the talk in 12 minutes. I promise you it's not, it's not a 12 minute talk. So if I need to slow down, just yell at me. Uh, so I want to talk about a topic that, uh, as mentioned, probably occupies way too much of my brain space. So before we get started, I want to talk about who am I? Uh, my name is Armand de Montremay. I'm an engineering manager at the Washington Post. And I manage the news applications interact interactive news teams, which are part of the news engineering department. Before joining the engineering department, I worked in the newsroom as a reporter and an assignment editor on the graphics desk for several years. So your first question might be, what is a news engineering team? No, we don't engineer the news. Har, 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 har. Uh, we build tools for reporters that help us to be a force multiplier for the data reporting, the graphics, the news design, the investigative teams, and other teams that produce some of the Post's most impactful storytelling efforts. We interact directly with newsroom teams to identify and deliver software and tooling that abstracts some of the repetitive processes that you go through during the, um, while you're reporting on a story, and it enables reporters to focus on producing high-quality, distinctive journalism. Um, our former director, who's also an attendee at this conference, likes to refer to it as the liminal space between computer science and software engineering. Uh, we actually have liminal space stickers. Um, and I really like this framing. So, this is, we're not actually dealing with scope creep here. We're just very focused while playing a game over Zoom. Uh, this is, we're playing Gartic phone. We're just like drawing on our computers. But I thought it was a good image of some of us and I like how focused we are. Um, and as you can probably tell from the Zoom screenshot, we're also a team that works primarily remotely. And being able to grow into a team that not just accepts, but thrives in a remote work environment, something that we're collectively very proud of. Uh, and if you feel that in-office work is the only or the best way to be doing the type of work that we do, we should probably talk. I don't think we really reach the end of history in the way that we work. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot to learn from. So anyways, what are we doing here? So I've worked at several positions as a manager now. Uh, first, I was a deputy for graphics at the Los Angeles Times, and then an assignment editor in graphics. Uh, and an engineering lead, and now an engineering manager at the Washington Post. Uh, I'm interested in language in general, and the idea for this talk grew from an interest I developed in the language and behaviors that people employ, uh, particularly in management roles. How do the roles we choose, how, no, how do the words we choose to use from a position of implicit power reflect how we see that power? How does my choice of words affect me as a manager, and how do they affect you as a coworker? How do these choices reinforce traditional organizational hierarchies? Words have power, and whether we intend to do so or not, the words we choose to describe ourselves, our roles, and the people we work with, they have meaning. And before we dive in, this is a disclaimer. These are just my kooky ideas, uh, but they do inform how I think about and how I perform my job. There's many good arguments for alternatives. Also, I'm not an academic, and unlike database stories that I've worked on, uh, there is no data set here that I've worked with uh, other than my own anecdotal experience, and this is mostly vibes-based. This is a vibes-based analysis. And one last caveat, I don't think we should assume any maliciousness from anyone who uses any of the word choices highlighted here. Um, we want to assume good intentions. This is a very common and pervasive habit, and I think most people have just never really thought much about it. Or maybe, actually, maybe I'm the one who's thinking too much about it. Um, and uh, anyways, let's do some goal setting. My goal for the talk is to share ideas about how our use of language can help us consider management your job as a role, not a, a, your, not a title. Well, your job has a title, and maybe it's a very fancy one. You know, you might be manager of interactive widgets or VP of Mucky Muck, you know, and it's probably a very hard job, and in a lot of times, it's a very lonely job. Um, that does not entitle you to people. Uh, it doesn't entitle you to authority. It doesn't entitle you to very much of anything, really. Uh, we want to reduce top-down thinking. 
where there's a single actor at the top of the organizational pyramid and everyone else doesn't really matter. It's that person at the top's world and we're just living in it. We wanna empower both individuals and the collective. It doesn't need to be zero sum. We can be stronger in this together. And understand the impact of some of the language that we use. Our words can lift people up and they can also bring people down. I wanna focus on the former. Okay, goal set. Let's talk about focusing on the role and not the person. All right, let's say you're a new manager. Congrats! You are probably promoted because you were really good at your old job. This is a typical path for new managers. And you know, you're really good at your job. Someone says, hey, what if instead of doing this job, you were in charge of other people doing this job? Well, guess what? That's not the same job anymore. Uh, and another note, you're also pretty likely to be bad at it at first. And th uh, that's another talk I like to give. Um, as a new manager, you're likely to make a lot of mistakes and hopefully learn from them. Uh, I've learned a lot by stepping on rakes like Sideshow Bob over the past few years. And once I started managing managers, a whole lot, of, a whole lot more rakes got thrown onto the field. Back to the topic. Anyways, you're in a new job. You may, or as odds are, since it's new, may not be any good at it. And even worse, the job isn't about your work anymore. And so why shouldn't that be reflected in your language? So, first term I wanna focus on is a very simple one. One we probably don't even think about. And it's the word, my. So this is incredibly ingrained in work culture. If you're lucky enough to have received some sort of management training uh, or read books on management, they're likely to have talked about your team. Uh, if, you, if you haven't received any formal training, and most of us haven't, you're probably going to just adapt the behaviors and the language of those around you. This is how we learn. And we end up with phrases like my team, my leads, my engineers, my staff. Now my is a simple modifier that denotes possession, and that's where the problem is. It says that something belongs to you. To say my when you're in a position of authority, you're implicitly taking possession of the object that you're referring to, whether you're aware of it or not. But a team consists of people. And implying that people belong to you, which is what's happening not just when you say my team, uh, but also, for example, my leads or my engineers, or this one really kills me, my interns, isn't that a little bit weird? And as you're saying my, whether you're, aware of it, whether you're aware of it or not, and that could lead you to think of it as yours. Can we see how that can enable toxic behaviors? It makes those asks to buckle down, do the impossible just a little bit easier if you're asking people who belong to you anyway. Even though I feel like a lot of the time, if you're asking a team to do the impossible, it's because someone or something else has failed along the way. And sometimes, maybe it was you. And meanwhile, how does it affect people to hear how you refer to them as belonging to you? To hear that they're your lead or your engineer or something that I would hear when I, when I was in a reporting context, context, like your photographer, when you were with a reporter on a story, how does that limit someone's agency? Okay, let's get back to you, Bojack. This has the effect of making it about the person in charge, you know, what they want, what they do. Not what the team wants or does, or even necessarily, sometimes, what the organization wants. How does this habit affect the rest of the organization? If teams are routinely conflated with a person, what happens if that person leaves? So what happens when a person leaves? I feel like that's something you should always be thinking about. Does the team have a purpose? Or does it all just fall apart when they, when they leave? And if it does, maybe it's because the structure never really made that much sense in the first place. Maybe the skills or knowledge to keep the team running were all siloed in one person. Um, you know, that person being you. And, you know, what I hear sometimes is, yes, this is, you know, this is, a, this is just a linguistic shortcut. And yes, it is. It's a linguistic shortcut and often a handy way to refer to teams. But if everyone else is referring to your team or Janice's team or Manuel's team, even as a shorthand, the emphasis gets taken off of the team and onto you as a person, or onto them as a person. Um, 
at some point, does the organization even know what these teams are or what their mission is? Beyond the fact that it's a shortcut when we use like my or your or Armand's team, the use of the singular possessive, the use of the singular possessive is exclusionary by nature. And then you might say, we use these terms deliberately. We want to empower you. We want to create feelings of ownership. And we'll talk a little bit more about ownership a bit later. Uh, and you know what, it, it's, it's right. To some extent, you might be empowering yourself. Um, my thought is that this comes specifically at the cost of empowerment or agency by others, uh, empowerment or agency by others on the team. And I don't think we have to look too deeply to have some insight into how this usage came about. You'll often see quotes from military leaders that refer to my men, and you know, there's a lot of explicit sexism in these terms. Um, and of course, plenty of instances in pop culture where you see this emulated, like this one. My men can eat their belts, but my tanks have gotta have gas. And with all respect to General Patton or the first Duke of Wellington quoted here, uh, I think after the Battle of Waterloo, um, using the language of military leaders, is that really how you see yourself and your role? And anyways, aren't we trying to move away from a great men of history mindset? If that's what you want, there's many other ways to elevate yourself as a leader. And, you know, I thought whether this is something, this is like gender-based, whether I, I, you know, this is more common among men or among women, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I've, I've seen, I feel like I've seen it equally in literature, I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, again, this is, uh, this is a very limited data set that I'm working with here. And I thought maybe that's just a way that large parts of the organization um, in larger companies get simplified. Again, this is, this is not a large data set that I'm working with. But how can you have an effective organization if you, if you essentially have people running what they see as like their own small little fiefdoms? So, uh, let's say you agree with me. I hope you do. Um, but it's such a handy term, I don't really know what to say instead, so what's like a more inclusive term for it? I like to say that I run the team, but it's not my team, and so I run, really, I help to run. Uh, the lead, the engineering leads do a tremendous amount of work, uh, the interactive news and news applications teams at the Washington Post. In other cases where that's inconvenient or too clunky, you can try replacing my with our. So our team is working on, or we're striving towards, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can try asking yourself, you know, what the team or the part of the organization that you oversee does. Is there a connecting thread here? Is there an overarching storyline? That or overarching storyline shouldn't be the person at the top. It should be a mission. And if you don't have a clear answer, Maybe, should, maybe that's a good opportunity to spend some time on organizational mission and goal setting. Do this collaboratively. Do this with the team. You might be surprised by what you come up with. When all else fails, just say the name of the team. It helps to reinforce the team's purpose in the organizational structure, both in your mind and in the minds of the people that you're speaking to. Reinforcing team purpose is generally a good thing. So anyways, what are we getting at here? Hopefully this moves us away from a place where we think of a manager as an authority or a power figure, someone whose power is vested in them by the nature of the job. What if instead the first thing we thought of when we, when we talked about a manager uh, was a, who, someone who is a facilitator or someone who empowers or someone who enables? So a manager who's not taking possession, but instead ensuring that people and teams have what they, thrive, what they need to thrive and grow. And, and that the team has what it needs to get the job done. All right, the second one. And as a note, I, I feel like these get a little bit spicier as they go along, so please bear with me. I get a little bit more opinionated. Um, so that is, uh, that is the word owning or ownership. So speaking of taking possession, you know, owning ownership dovetail nicely with this another term that connotes possession. So these are typically used in different contexts. 
owning refers to a, diff, um, a direct line of responsibility. And ownership is more of like a concept. I, I find them both a little bit strange when they're used in a labor context. So with the concept of my, as mentioned before, it feels like there's a good, kind of problematic historical record of authority figures referring to my, you know, X. Uh, but what about ownership? When did this concept come about? I was pretty curious about this. I went down a, a little bit of a rabbit hole here. Because I really wanted to know when people started saying this. So I'm going to take you with me. I did a little research on Google Books uh, using their Ingram viewer to see if I could get a sense of the usage of the term historically. I started with the, just the broadest sense, the term ownership. Here we can see a gradual rise, like late, late 19th, throughout the 20th century, sharp increase looking to be around 1970, peaking in 2000. So I thought that was a good start, but let's get a little more focus here. So I looked up employee ownership, thinking maybe that would be more fruitful. After all, isn't that what the phrase is trying to do, like cultivate feelings of ownership among employees? So I thought this was really interesting. And when I looked at the references, many of them refer to actual employee, employee ownership of a company, whether that's like in shares or whether a more cooperative form. So usage appears to peak around 1927, thought that was interesting before dropping steeply, uh, only coming back in like the 1980s until about 2000. So I thought, you know, what is it that I'm really looking for here? The term that I'm really looking for is take ownership. You know, you might think that it took me way too long to get here, but anyways, um, I could think of lots of cases where ownership and employee ownership might occur, but I couldn't think of any instances of take ownership from, you know, from the early 20th century. So what happens if I search for that? This happens. So I thought, aha, okay. So the term skyrockets in use, and it looks like it started around 1977. So looking at this chart, um, this makes me think that there was a book or something written, some sort of seminal piece of literature, like business literature, that really caused the usage of the term to take off. I couldn't figure out what it was. So if, if any of y'all know, <laughs> know what it could be, like, I would be really interested to know that. Um, yeah, please, please let me know. Um, and then more rhetorically, when we say take ownership, what are we asking you to own? Like, what is it that you're owning? All right, I have one more chart here. And I just find it really interesting that employee ownership declines just as take ownership is just like skyrocketing in use. I don't know if there's a direct correlation or if there's a causation here. I just find it interesting. All right. And as for owning, this is one of my favorite questions. I also find the usage really strange. Like, do you own this database? Do you own this? Do you own this? You know, for questions like who owns this database or who owns this section of work, again, like, what is it that you're asking? What are you implying? I might, be, I might be being a little bit too pedantic here, but I don't own anything at work. Our infrastructure is all rented from AWS. This is my Washington Post computer. It is borrowed from the company. If I leave the company, I shut it off, I give it to IT, I never think about it again. The database like I theoretically own, if I leave the company, I never think about it again. I don't take it with me. I don't own it. Someone else has to pick it up. <laughs> it becomes their job. Um, I'm responsible for work. I'm accountable for it. I take that really, really seriously. Like, I do not trivialize that. Um, and we'll get, to, we'll get to that later. But I, I just think, like, isn't it ironic that we're asking people to take on and like, own parts of our business without giving them any actual stake in it in a lot of cases? Like, for instance, like, you're asking people to own their work. And I live in Washington, DC. It is one of the most expensive housing markets in the country. And before that, I lived in Los Angeles. Again, one of the most ho expensive housing markets in the country. And in many cases, you're asking people to own their work, but you're not paying them enough to be able to own like a house or even like an apartment or a condo in that city. And you're asking them to like, at the same time, own work. What, that just doesn't feel right to me. So one caveat here. You should, you should absolutely own your mistakes. You always take those with you, wherever you go. And it, it, it feels surprising sometimes so many, how many times you don't see people owning up to them. 
Again, bringing it back to the main theme, these are individualistic terms. So if someone owns something as a concept, yes, they're accountable for it. The terms ownership also comes with notions of exclusivity and territoriality that could be detrimental to the functioning of an organization. Hey, I own this, not you. If you have the owner, you have an individual who possesses. That person could be a guardian or a steward, and, and that's, general, that's a good thing. You know, that person could also be a gatekeeper, which is, you know, obviously bad. So what if in this case, again, we steered away from the language of individual ownership and instead emphasize something that connotes collective responsibility? What if we used other words instead? What would those words be? You know, responsibility, like who is responsible for X? Not that hard to say. Accountability, who's accountable for an outcome? If you're referring to a process, instead of saying who owns the process, how about who facilitates it or who champions it? And again, we've gone over a couple, but I want you to think of what other terms we might be using that are, you know, again, intentionally or unintentionally disempowering or exclusionary. Um, for me, another one that, uh, is, is headcount, you know? These are people, like, they're not just heads. I don't love it abstracting people into headcount. And then think about what we can do to change that. And how can we use language that instead equalizes and shares power among team members, you know, increases engagement and responsibility, and promotes psychological safety, and doesn't centralize, but instead shares organizational power. And at the end of the day, it just talks about people and thinks of them as people. All right, there's one last term to discuss. And again, these get a little bit spicier as they go along. They, you know, th this one is usage of the word leadership. And this might be, you know, where I lose you. This might be the last straw. Please bear with me here. Sometimes we say leadership when we just mean managers. You know, for example, we say something like, leadership has decided that we're going to pivot from cupcakes and we're gonna focus on donuts. So, by the way, here, you should always focus on donuts. Just not, just not Duncan, I don't know. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm not from the Northeast, I'm sorry if I'm, yeah. Uh, this statement, so this statement refers to the organizational formal leaders of the team on the org chart. Yes, it does. But it also refers to leadership as some sort of, you know, abstract organizational entity. This is the, this is the entity with decision-making power, and that's isolated from those with no decision-making power. So it's the people at the end of the long conference table concentrating power. By the way, I hate when people do this. You know, what, like, what, what if instead of having the long conference table with everybody with power at the end, all the decision makers, all the, you know, the editor of the paper, all the managing editors, I'm using a newsroom context here, what if instead you just scattered those positions around the table and had the top person sit in the middle, like the middle of the widest part of the table instead? You know, how would that affect people's discussions and like how people talk about a topic? I, I you know, I, Surely, you know, I feel like we've all been at the far end of the table or on a seat like around the edge of the conference room struggling to like listen in and take notes on like what's actually being said, but the problem is that the, the two people are sitting right next to each other, so they're not really speaking very loudly. So, so that sucks, doesn't it? I hate conference rooms. So anyways, all right, back to the talk. Leadership meets, leadership discusses, leadership decides. That's how it is, right? So you might be in the formal role of leadership, but are you really exhibiting leadership if you expect everyone to have no choice but to accept what you say? Instead, I think leadership's a behavior. Fair, paraphrase a quote from a manager I once had, it's, it's an influence operation, and we heard that earlier today. You know, if you have to use force or the weight of your authority to compel people to do something that they don't wanna do, you're already failing. And what's more, Leadership can and should, you know, again, referring to the talk earlier, like it, sh it, it can be exhibited by anyone in the organization. I've seen interns exhibit more leadership and do more to exert positive change in an organization than I have CEOs. And I hope everyone on a team feels the opportunity to exhibit leadership or to be a leader. Even if you're an intern or a new hire on a team, like propose something new. Tell me what we're doing wrong. You know, fresh perspectives are an asset. And if they don't feel the opportunity, if they don't feel the trust there, if they don't trust me to be able to bring something up and discuss like changes, then I consider that a failure on my part. 
So management is a role, and even capital L leadership, you know, that's not an entity, but that's a set of behaviors. Yes, you, see, you should exhibit leadership as a manager. You know, that, that is part of the, a lot of times, part of the job. And also, it's a yes and, and also, anyone is capable of exhibiting leadership in an organization, you know, not just managers. So what are some examples of these behaviors? How about, you know, organi organizing celebrations, even small ones, like making sure somebody has, a, has like a little, little treat on their birthday, like a little baked good or something. Or going out of your way to mentor somebody that you know is struggling and making sure that they have what they need. Or starting an, in an initiative, like a weekly meeting where people can come, they can share coding challenges with a larger group, like whatever team they're on, you know, newsroom, engineering, any department, wherever. Or cultivating an expertise, but not just satisfied with that, creating documentation pro and creating the process, sharing these skills with teammates. All of these are, are real world, world cases that I've seen. And the cases just go on and on and on and on and on. And one of the most dangerous concepts when we're managing an organization or a team of any size is just accepting things as they are. You know, thinking that because they are that way, that's how they should be. I'm guilty of this as well. You know, inertia is a powerful force. I've, I've referred to like thinking that we're at the end of history for, for how we work. It's a dangerous concept. And to combat this, I try to employ a couple of questions, and they're really simple. You know, when a new idea seems implausible because things have always been a certain way, just, but what if they weren't? You know, again, think of remote work in this case. You know, four years ago, unless you were already working in that context, um, who would have thought so much would have been possible on a distributed basis? You know, what are ways that we've adapted to accommodate that in ways we, we would have never imagined previously? You know, or, or if we're resistant to an idea because it hasn't been done before, uh, because it doesn't conform to our way of understanding, just ask, like, why not? You know, why is that the case? Uh, do that reflection, I, you know, within yourself. In a lot of cases, what do you have to lose by trying? The majority of the time, the stakes aren't life and death, so just give it a shot. But back to leadership. Uh, in all, I, I think the term leadership and everything else I've mentioned here, it all just comes back to a few things. Not just making sure that others can follow your path, but just making sure, but also making sure that they feel empowered to chart their own and know that they'll have your support in it and your trust. And maybe, you know, just maybe oh, trying to make the organizational structure a little bit less steep overall. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, contact information's up there. Thank you.